What did you make of how Farrell played, Charlie? Yeah, just just kind of what we'd come to expect from him before that kind of odd spell post World Cup with injuries and COVID, I think. Um, and anybody who's watched any of how he's gone with Saracens this season, kind of conducting, you know, as we as we keep kind of I feel like I keep going on about Sar how Saracens are attacking, but it is really refreshing what they're doing. And Farrell has been along with Daly and Alex Good has been a really big part of that. Um, he translated that quite nicely. Um, I think maybe not enough has been said about how he's taken a step back to go to 12 to try and allow Smith to flourish into that 10 role. And although that makes the backline a bit unbalanced and doesn't give Smith the kind of tools that he's got, I think that will will come good for Smith eventually and he will potentially look back on this period as quite beneficial. Um, having said that, I think I would go back in the, in the last two games of the autumn to a kind of more balanced midfield with Farrell at 10 and, and Smith could be a really, you know, in the same mould that Damien McKenzie was looking for New Zealand as that really devastating, game-changing number 22, I think Smith can do a similar role because um, he, was, he was sort of overreaching, it felt. There was a, in, right at the end of the game, if you watch it back, um, Smith is in a second wave, gets played in by Farrell on a pullback and Tom Curry's got a walk in, but he, but he, but Smith lobs a pass over to Stewart, and it's really jarring because you don't see him make those sorts of decisions for, for Harlequins. Um, I think he'll come good for sure, and I think it would just, it might just be a change of role coming up. He might, I mean, Eddie Jones might um, persist because he really wants this midfield to work, as he said time and again. But um, again, we find ourselves talking about the England midfield and how we're coming up to a pivotal kind of selection for it. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, I said on the first episode that I play uh, in Farrell at 10 and I'd, I think I'd move him there for, for New Zealand and um, for New Zealand and South Africa. I mean, you know, Eddie Jones talks about how, how the game now has become a 23-man game and he's got a, well, maybe put his money where his mouth is slightly now and, and he, there isn't a better number 22 in, in, in world rugby than, than Marcus Smith and him coming off the bench to change the game and to ignite pace a, a bit like, um, or to, to inject pace, a bit like Jack Van Portfleet did against Argentina. You know that that's that that would terrify opposition defences, and it might just let him settle in a little bit more. As you said, it looked like he was trying too hard, maybe and overplaying slightly, and that's maybe why he sort of missed that pass at the end. Mm. Should add that we maybe it's because we did analysis on it last week, watching sort of England's attacking shape with Farrell first, and then Smith leaping around the back. But when Farrell in the opening minutes actually took a pass from Van Portfleet and just sort of crashed up through the middle and made good meters. Both Charlie yeah. and I were sat in the stands going, oh, that's different. And, and that really that really caught our eye, didn't it? We were thinking, OK, maybe, they, maybe they've they got a few more tricks up their sleeve. Mm. You, don't, you don't see that a lot from Farrell. I think it was kind of a way of... Coaches talk about shaping the defence early on in games, don't they? And, and sometimes that can mean sort of kick passes to make sure that they're um, keeping that wi those wings honest. And this seemed like a kind of ploy to keep... Um, Japan's midfield, honest, and going. You know, Farrell's just not not just a part, not just going to pass all day. But it turns out he sort of did after that one carry. It's quite interesting. The, it's the directness as well, though, that we spoke about after Argentina against Argentina. England looked best when they're at the most direct. Yes, uh, you have to be inventive within that and have skillful players. But there was the, we were too lateral. England were too lateral against Argentina, and at times overplayed and then against Japan it, it seemed as if there, there was more directness you look at Genji's try when when Sinclair's running that great out to win line off nine and then you've got Genji following up there was a lot more directness to it and I thought that's when the, and, and as you've mentioned the Farrell carry and that's that's when England look like they're at their best because they've got very good ball carriers you know they, re they really do and when they get the motoring they're dangerous and not many teams can handle them Definitely moments of promise, but I, th I think as Will Greenwood said in this column, I'm, I'm not getting out the bunting either because it wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't totally overawed by it. The All Blacks are coming to town. That is very exciting. But before we quickly talk about the All Blacks, can we just think about selection changes that we would make for the New Zealand game? Who who do you want to sort of see come in from that side? My first thought is maybe that Guy Porter won't play at 13, and if we're benching Smith and we're benching Porter, essentially, if you score two tries against Japan, you're not in the team the following week, by the sounds of things. Uh, what changes would you guys make to that team? I think Slade's look really hungry. Mm -hmm. um, bit of a kind of misfire, it was a sort of summed up, a bit of a misfiring afternoon before it happened, and he didn't he led England out and nobody sort of acknowledged that it was his 50th cap that he was getting from the bench. <laughs> Do you remember? That was kind of a bit of an odd moment to start the whole thing off um, on Saturday, but he looked really hungry. In, in at 15, with Stewart moving to the to the right wing as they did against Australia a year ago, which in that's with um, when Manu, Manu Tuilagi had the sneaky kind of false 14 on. Um, I'd expect, well, I'd, I'd actually, I say I'd expect, I've no idea, but I think um, <laughs> I think we might see uh, Tuilagi and Slade teaming up um, just in midfield. 
pack's really interesting as well. Clearly, he doesn't want um, Charles. You asked Eddie Jones, didn't you, in the in the live on um, team announcement day whether he'd considered teaming up Willis and Curry. That doesn't yeah. seem to be an option. No, um, he's good on that. Yeah, but we'll see. I think I think they they beat in that 2019 game, which they referenced after the game against Japan. They beat they beat England. Sorry, they beat New Zealand with two lineout jumpers in Laws and and Otoji starting. Um, I just want I just wonder whether they they change that back row up a little bit. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, he seemed pretty, you know, pretty damning about about Jack Willis in that he didn't, he, he he will not pick him in the same back row as Tom Curry, and not damning about Jack Willis as a player, just that how he fits in at the minute. With, he wants, with wants three line out jumpers. He wants wasn't he? three line out jumpers. He wants he wants three line out jumpers. One of whom is at, one of whom is at six, um, and and that's what he wants, and and and, and that's how he's going to pick his team. And, and unfortunately, Jack Willis seems to be the sort of collateral to that at the minute. Maybe it's because I was watching the, the 2019 semi-final last week for some analysis, but Slade came on at fullback in that, I think, against New Zealand. And there were nice little touches there where I thought, mm, I wonder if England might go back to that. Um, I think Jack Van Portfleet has to start at nine. We're, I think we're all mm-hmm. basically agreed on that. Because we've said that, now he might not. Because yeah. that tends to be how, tends these, to be what how these things work. So, yeah, don't, don't tell anybody. Um, and what do we make of the All Blacks after their game against Scotland and how they sort of played so far this autumn? Are we, are we I don't know. Are In we... off and on, off and on, off and on, haven't they? They look really imposing against Wales, far less so um, against Scotland. But they, they're they sort of doing that with their selection as well. They're mixing it up one week and then seemingly going full noise one week. They'll clearly be full noise um, this week coming. Um, Having said that, they were kind of. I mean, they were they were staring down the barrel, weren't they? Really, at mm. Murrayfield, and they managed to kind of pull that back. Um, what a missed opportunity for Scotland, though. I know. Yeah, they uh, they will get. Be- I'm sure they will in the future get better opportunities, um, but maybe not for a while, and they certainly haven't for a while. Um, but they just could, you know, just couldn't hold on there. I think there are. It was interesting that New Zealand kind of went back to what served them so well against Wales which was just being that really 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 direct and TJ Paranara just sort of took that game by the scruff of his neck as he uh, scruff of its neck as he has done so often oh, he's, he's just one of my favourite players just such a charismatic he leader that. isn't he mm-hmm. so he can be so influ- influential for them his face those. at the final whistle was a picture just really so animated no yeah. like screaming I remember that towards the end in the, in the closing stages whenever a decision went the All Blacks way he was really giving it big licks yeah um, he'd be not yeah. I mean it's officiating episode he'd be top three nightmares to referee oh yeah oh, definitely. yeah he would be he would be such a good player um, last England win over New Zealand that took them of course was 2012 said that nervously I thought it was a trick <laughs> question for a second You're okay no no I've, I've, just, I've just looked it up on, on the laptop yeah it was 2012 <laughs> It's been a long time. Mm. This time, England going to do it? I think, I think it'd be damaging if they didn't. I think mm. that would that would be a sixth test defeat of the year. Um, it would mean that they could only get to a fifty percent um, win ratio, which is going to be difficult to attain anyway. Obviously, because South Africa are after that. But um, I think we, you know Eddie Jones was talking a lot about how it's such a historic fixture and how. Um, you know how it has been such a big deal for players to get over the line against New Zealand. And that's why kind of the, the 2019 win was so important. But this is a this is a New Zealand team patently in in transition, and England have got to be ruthless with that. Yeah, I mean Eddie seems to. The, the flip side is that England and Eddie Jones always seem to lift their game when they're playing New Zealand. You see, you, we we recall 2019, but also there was that game in 2018 when. England came very, very close to beating New Zealand, who were at the time excellent on the back of on the back of that Lions tour series draw in 2017. An excellent New Zealand team, and they came within a uh, what well, it, it was a, an offside. Courtney Laws charged down offside, uh, and where Sam Hill went and scored. Oh, yeah. um, you know, a, a whisker of beating them again at Twickenham. There's 2012 as well. I know Eddie wasn't involved then, but some of the players that are around now are, and and they're aware of what it takes and. I think I think New Zealand at the minute are the better team and that they have more cohesion in, the, in their starting fifteen in their first choice fifteen. But that's only because they've been playing together for the whole for the whole of our summer. I think it's going to be really close. Um, England will have to go up another level to win. But I think New Zealand just to nick it a yeah. close one. Yeah, I'm back in New Zealand as well. Unsure why, but I am. <laughs> 